Welcome to our DUP lesson for January. It is about pioneer cooking, and this one's kind of a fun one. If any of you want some recipes that are at the end of the lesson, I would be happy to email those to you. Just let me know. Uh, let me go ahead and start with a quote. This quote is by Millie Foster Cheeseman. She said, if the pioneers wanted fruit, they planted trees. If they wanted vegetables, they grew them. If they needed meat, they hunted or raised the animals, slaughtered and preserved them. If they needed grain, they planted it, took it to a mill, and had it ground. So, in other words, they had to sustain themselves from day one in every aspect of their lives. Um, keeping in mind that most of these were immigrants who had different jobs. They were not all farmers when they came to the United States even, or when they came to the Plains. So they had to learn all of these trades um, that they probably did not know before they came. Here is uh, another quote, I, I like this one. This one is from biography of James Whitaker. He was a pioneer of 1851. He said, um, talking about some of the immigrants that came, came across and what they had, they were the proud possessors of two wagons and one yoke of oxen and one yoke of cows. The cows were milked in the morning and the milk placed in a well-covered jar. When they reached camp at night, there would be lumps of butter floating on the milk. Grandfather brought dried fruit and dried fish and other concentrated foods from England, which was a great help to his family on the journey. They also had flour, sugar, salt, and some vegetables. Being of a generous nature, many hungry mouths were helped from this supply. Grandfather believed the Lord helped those who helped themselves. So they kind of had what they brought along or what they hunted along the way. So they usually had a hunter assigned in the wagon trains as they went across to kill venison, buffalo, antelope, geese, chickens, ducks, um, jackrabbits. They caught fish in the streams. They found berries when they could, currants, service berries, bullberries, choke cherries, wild strawberries, and gooseberries. And a lot of the pioneers owned a dairy cow as well that could give them the milk and butter that they needed each day. So the first few years in the valley were pretty rough. You had them planting all of their seeds that first year and while they're waiting for their crops to mature, keeping in mind they had used most of their food to get to the valley, and when they're at the valley, there's not a whole lot to be found there. And so they started eating sago, sago lily roots, they cooked wild greens that grew in the ditches, they fished and hunted. Um, and as they came across, the pioneer women also only brought the bare necessities for what they needed. So sometimes that was an iron pot or a kettle, it might be a frying pan or a griddle. Um, all these they needed to learn to use on the trail as they came across. Uh, the bake oven was probably the most important cooking tool. So it, it, imagine it's very much like a Dutch oven. It's got a lid on it and you put it in the coals of the fire and you can put the coals on top as well, very much like we do with a Dutch oven today. And you could make your biscuits, your cornbread, your loaves, um, whatever you needed to do, just knowing that it's not an exact science and they did the best they could with what they had. So they said, as soon as they came into camp, bread was baked, as soon as the fire was ready, because it took a long time, and the bake oven was hot. So while the rest of the camp was being organized, that was happening. And if the pioneer woman did not have an oven to bake in, she had to use the fire at the end of the day when all that was left were the, the live coals for her baking. And so she was, you know, not dealing with controllable heat, cold spots here, warm spots here, uh, might not be hot at the end of the day, they had to test it by just filling it with the, you know, with their hands to see if it was, if it was warm enough. And measuring, so this is, is kind of cute. You had, the measuring units were a dash, a pinch, a handful, a piece of fat the size of a goose egg, a bit of this. So you had to kind of have this innate sense of, of your cooking measurements as you went along. Um, they, they, when they were given sugar or they had opportunities to make treats, they always hid them away for Christmas as these were very special to have. And I, I, I want to share with you some rules for eating in the early days. See how good you are. Never sit down to a table with an anxious or disturbed mind. How many of us have sat down at the table with a disturbed mind? It says, better a hundred times omit that meal, for there will then be that much more food in the world for hungrier stomachs than yours. And besides, eating under such circumstances can only and will always prolong and aggravate the condition of things. Number two, never sit down to a meal after any intense mental effort, for physical and mental injury are inevitable and no one has a right to deliberately injure body, mind, or estate. Number three, 
never go to a full table during bodily exhaustion. I'm thinking these women were probably exhausted all the time. Let's see, it says, being exhausted was designated as being worn out, tired to death, used up, overdone. Uh, the wisest thing to do under such, such circumstances is to take a cracker and a cup of warm tea, either black or green, and no more. In 10 minutes, you'll feel a degree of refreshment and liveliness, which will be pleasantly surprising to you. Not of the transient kind, with a glass, which a glass of liquor affords, but permanent. But the tea gives present stimulus and a little strength, and before it subsides, nutrient begins to be drawn from the sugar and cream and bread, thus allowing the body gradually and by safe degrees to regain its usual vigor. Then in a couple of hours, a full meal may be taken, provided that it does not bring it later than two hours before sundown. If later, then take nothing for that day in addition to the cracker and tea, and the next day you will feel a, a freshness and vigor not recently known. I'm not sure many of us uh, take that to heart, do we? And it says, no lady will require to be advised a second time who will conform to the above rules. While it is a fact of no unusual observation among intelligent physicians that eating hearty under bodily exhaustion is not infrequently the cause of alarming and painful illness and sometimes sudden death, these things being so, let's see, these things being so, let every family make it a point to assemble around a table with kindly feelings, with cheerful humor and a courteous spirit and let that member of it be sent from it in disgrace who presumes to mar the reunion by sullen silence or impatient look or angry tones or complaining tongue. Eat ever in thankful gladness or away with you to the kitchen. I'm thinking I should send a lot of my kids to the kitchen <laughs> when we eat. Oh, okay. So now we have, go ahead and go to the next slide. We have a woman whose name is Emily Stewart Barnes. She was a pioneer of 1851. That's when she arrived into the Salt Lake Valley. And she came at the age of five with her parents and her sister. She was born in England in 1846. And her parents joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and then began immediately to pay for their, their, their passage to the United States. They had to raise half a year's wages for the trip. And then they finally sailed from Liverpool in 1850 on a ship called the James Pennell. And a storm came up tearing off the main mast, leaving them adrift helpless for 11 days. And they were finally rescued by a steamer and taken to the New Orleans Harbor on November 22nd, 1850. And Emily remembers, it's just that young child, walking every day as they crossed the plains. And they finally settled in Kaysville. So a few of these things you will recognize. Uh, the name is probably familiar to many of you. We've got Barnes Park and the Stewart family. And let's see a few of the things that, that she was able to accomplish. Okay, so... This is, uh, keeping in mind, we're talking about food and everything kind of food related. This is what she wrote. She said, just before we reached Salt Lake, our food gave out and still we were going along. I remember so well how hungry I was. I kept saying, mother, give me something to eat, please, mother, I am so hungry. Mother would answer, I can't, I have nothing to give you. Only a little piece of that dried buffalo meat. It was so hard and dry that I could not get one bite, but I kept trying and went to sleep trying. I woke up next morning still hungry but soon that dear William B. Smith came with bread, which his wife, Aunt Anna Smith, had baked. One thing I do remember, he had brought a big round loaf of bread, the biggest you ever saw. Why, it looked as big as a grindstone to me, and it was, as, it was a sweet piece. You see, they did not have stoves in which to bake in these days, just a large iron bake skillet with a lid on it. They would pull it out of the fire. They would pull out from the fireplace some coals, which they would put under the skillet, and then some more coals on top of the lid. If very careful, you had a large loaf of bread, nice and brown. So you see how blessed we were? The panes had a turnip patch and we would run, over, run up over the field north of their home to Holmes Creek to get the good turnips and eat them. Everything seemed good to eat then. So we would stay and eat turnips all day long or as long as we dared. And she continues, we did not have a stove to cook on, only a little black kettle and one frying pan. I must tell you how we made a fire and a light. We had a little tinder box with a lid that shut down. We would save every piece of rag with which to make tinder. We would burn the rags until it was black, put it in the box, shut down the lid, and it was ready. We always had to keep tinder in the box, for if we forgot it, we would have to run to a neighbor's place and borrow some fire hot coals. If our tinder box was full, we got a fire in the morning very quickly with plenty of shaved up wood or bark. We would have a flint and a piece of steel and strike the flint on the steel so the sparks would fall on the tinder. Then we would roll the tinder in a piece of rag and swing it in the air for a few minutes until it took fire. 
So you could just imagine them swinging these, these that little spark in the air until it caught fire because of the um, because of the air circulating in it. Uh, mother made a little bread cake and put it in the frying pan over some coals pulled from the fireplace. Then she would tip the frying pan, holding it close to the fire, and that would cook the cake on top. After a while, I did not remember how long, we got an iron bake kettle with a lid so that we could put hot coals on top of the kettle as well as beneath it. Then we began to have big round loaves of bread. We had no sugar, no tea, no pepper, no fruit of any kind, but we had squash, potatoes, and corn, as well as salt from the lake. Once in a while, mother would have something special for dinner. It was a cake made with light dough into which she would put one cup of squash, a piece of butter, and a few dried service berries. Rarely, we had stewed chicken and dumplings, a wonderful dinner. We would dry the squash by cutting it into rings, peeling them, and hanging them on a long stick. We used dried squash to make pies in the winter. Then we would dry tomatoes and ground, and ground cherries for winter use, as the ground cherries would help to sweeten the pies. Sometimes father would raise a few white beets, and we would press out the juice and boil it down to a jelly. It tasted very sweet and good. Our food was very scarce, and as we did not know what to do, Aunt Betsy Burton said it would be a good thing to get haws, or the fruit of a hawthorn, and dry them, pick them, put them in a pot with a little water, and shake them, and put them on plates to dry. As they dried, we rolled them into balls so that in the winter, they would help us to keep alive. And you'll recognize this next part. John Winell, from the Winell Mill, was the first miller in Kaysville, and for many years, the only one I can remember well going to John Winell's mill in 1856, and he was owing my father for shoe work. My sister Susanna and I went. She made me ask if we could get a little flour or bran. He looked at me and said, my child, don't you wish you was in heaven? I have nothing but a little bran. I will give you that. I believe we looked starved and hungry, so I was uh, starved and hungry. I was 10 in May, and this was in July. We were so pleased we hurried home. The sack had no string to tie it with, so we spilled the bran and gathered it up. Mother made a cake, put it in the frying pan to cook. When cooked, it was bran again, and there was no flour left in it. We were so hungry, we ate the dry bran. <laughs> so these poor kids, right? Um, let's see, and she was eventually buried in the Kaysville Cemetery, once again, coming from that, that famous Barnes family. Um, Brigham Young was, was very interesting. He had said the first duty of a saint uh, when he comes to the valley is to learn how to grow a vegetable, after which he must learn how to rear pigs and fowls, to irrigate his land, and to build his house. The rest will come in time. And then we have um, a series of unfortunate things that happened. So the harvest of 1847, it only gave them a few potatoes. So these poor people were rationed and starving and they had to live off of what they could catch and the roots that they could dig up in the ground. And then you have 1848 and 49, the crops were not very good and it wasn't um, enough to feed the settlers again. And then the summer of 1849, they, they saw a renewed burst of energy and ingenuity. So they were first kind of handicapped by the, oh, and I, I did miss, so we had 1847 and then 1848, that was when the crickets, or excuse me, when the, um, yeah, when the crickets came and ate their crops, a lot of their crops, and the seagulls came and rescued them, but they still didn't have the full harvest that they would have had. And then 1848 and 49, they had to ration again because um, conditions were so poor again. But in 1849, they finally saw some progress. The soil was turning out a little bit better, and they were um, understanding how to harvest their, their things um, a lot better. And then a local newspaper said the 24th of July was a day long to be remembered as the anniversary of the arrival of the pioneers two years previous. We hold 12 or 1500 feet of tables filling the bower and all adjoining grounds loaded with all luxuries of the field and gardens and nearly all the varieties that any vegetable market in the world could produce. So at this time, two years later, they're finally starting to produce enough for what they need. Um, and then also you, gotta, you have to remember that these pioneers, they all came from very different countries. And a lot of the recipes that were handed down were handed down by watching a mother or a grandmother make the recipe. And then um, it would be passed down just verbally. Not a lot of it was written down. And they didn't have the ingredients that they needed for a lot of their hometown recipes either. So when their crops started to produce and they were able to have a garden in their, near their home and have some of the, 
the foods that they were used to having, they were able to bring out these recipes again. And in a very short time, they started to have social events where they would make their, uh, their traditional meals from their homelands, and then they would start to share those recipes. So in that very short time, you had a lot of, a lot of different recipes that were shared from different countries, and they were adapted and changed into um, some unique recipes. Um, and at this time, stoves had begun to be replaced. Uh, oh, stoves had begun to replace the open fires that they were using to cook over. So that became a little bit easier for them. And let's see, we also had the Doctrine and Covenants 89, the dietary, not restrictions, but the dietary code that was given to us and encouraging us by Joseph Smith to um, eat healthy. And so all those things kind of produced a unique mixing pot for the recipes of the time. So once again, they did everything, most things they needed to have fire with. So keeping coals that were hot, instead of letting them burn out completely at night so they could just relight the fire in the morning from hot coal, you know, from the coals that were kind of smoldering all night long, that was very important. And if they weren't able to make bread every day, it was very laborious and they needed the oven and everything. So a couple times a week they would have their, their bread and then they got the coal stove, which made, made things so much easier. But even then, imagine, you've got a coal stove. You're going to have, right where the, the coal is and the fire is, it's going to be very hot. The outskirts are going to be very cold. It's not like you could turn a little knob and adjust the temperature of your burner. So I can't imagine having to cook under the conditions that these wonderful pioneers cooked under. Okay, we are going to now talk about this cute couple, Violet Gray and Arthur Rubin. So Violet Gray Rubin and Arthur Rubin. We have one of the earliest cookbooks um, coming from Violet Gray, and I'll show you some pictures in just a minute. Let me give you a little bit of background of them. Their story is, is really cute. So we have Violet Gray. She was a native pioneer of Murray, Utah, and she was born in, on December 21st, 1868. And eventually she accepted employment, employment at Fort Douglas under Captain Richards. And while she was there, she was actually placing flowers on a grave. A young man noticed her and she thought, he thought she was beautiful. So his name was Arthur. And he was a native of Prussia, East Prussia. So he spoke German. He was born in 1859. And he wanted to come across the Americas, to the Americas. So he became a seaman for a one-way passage. And it took many months for him to make that, the, the passage as they had to go to different ports and everything. And he acquired the skill of repairing sails and, and uniforms and things. So sewing, he became very adept at sewing. And he had a, he finally, he landed in, in the United States on the port that he was supposed to be at, but he was having such a hard time learning the language and trying to figure out how to fit in. So he had a shipmate who said, you need to enlist in the United States Army so that you can become a citizen and you can learn English and learn your new way of life. And that's when he got sent to Fort Douglas. And it soon became apparent that his sewing skills were much needed. So instead of being on guard duty, he was then put on um, sewing. And it says that in the year 1888, he finally became an agent for the Singer sewing machine. The sewing machines were becoming very popular at that time, and he would take them by horse and buckboard through Utah County selling these sewing machines. Anyway, so he saw Violet in the cemetery, so he wrote to his family in East Prussia and said, can you write to her family and see if I can meet her? So very formal, right? They had no objection, so he introduced himself, and then eventually they were married in 1894, and they settled in Murray. And let me show you this. This is her cookbook. You can see the cover. It's well used. Uh, the, the top picture is a sugar bowl, and that was from Violet Gray as well. Um, the picture makes it look, look pretty big, but it was just a small sugar bowl, a little, little, little sugar bowl with a lid on it. Um, so these cookbooks, like this one that's shown here, they were usually just notebooks and they would handwrite all the recipes. And unfortunately this one, she had handwritten recipes on every page and then later she started pasting recipes from newspapers on top of that. So some of those handwritten recipes are a little bit gone. Um, 
okay, here's a, a funny story. So remember that Arthur was selling sewing machines. He was also repairing them. And one day he was, he, the lower tension screw of a treadle machine. So it's just this little itty bitty screw. And it says it was um, black paint and small pieces of mother pearl with gold trim. And this little screw came up missing. And he made it a habit of repairing these sewing machines just outside in the yard. And you could not sew without this because this little screw would regulate the tightness of the thread and you couldn't sew without it. And he was at a loss, this tiny screw outside. Everybody stopped to search for it. And then someone said, maybe the chickens ate it. And so they put all the chickens into their coop and one by one <laughs> took them to the chopping block and searched their gizzards until finally they, lo and behold, they did find this tension screw and he was able to clean it up and repair the sewing machine. I thought <laughs> that was hilarious. So even though they didn't have many eggs after that, they did have plenty of chicken, fried chicken, all the chicken you could imagine. Okay, so we have, let me show you a couple pages of Violet's cookbook. These were kind of fascinating. Um, it's probably hard for you to read on your screen. Excuse me, this, these are three pages in her, in her notebook filled up with how to make mock turtle soup, the recipe. And it's, it's amazing. These recipes, as I'm reading through them, were very labor intensive and they used every single part of every type of animal. It was amazing. Let me just turn over a couple of pages. I wanna show you this one too. This is a French candy recipe. And this one was amazing. It was like three pages long, very, very detailed and laborious. And I wanted you to notice here, it's, she wrote it on the Singer, the Singer Manufacturing Company. So her husband's business, of course, on his letterhead, <laughs> that was really sweet. So this was a, a recipe from the 1890s. Okay, now to get a good idea of things that they would put into the recipe books, they didn't just put recipes. They put, let me share a couple things. They put poems, they put words of advice. There was, she had, in Violet's cookbook, she had written what to eat with the fingers. So what's, what's allowed to eat with your fingers, what's not. Cheese apparently is allowed to eat with your fingers. Um, words of wisdom, remedies, if you got sick, everything would be in this cookbook. It was a very prized possession. Here's some odds and ends that I thought were really funny that were found in her cookbook, this um, Mrs. Gray's cookbook. She said, cold rainwater and soap will remove machine grease from washable fabrics. We're gonna start getting a book of rainwater now, aren't we? Milk, which has changed, may be sweetened or rendered fit for use again by stirring in a little soda. A tablespoon of turpentine boiled with white clothes will greatly aid in the whitening process. Oh, here, this one's good, I like this one. Thoroughly wetting the hair once with a solution of salt and water will keep it from falling out. So if any of you try this, you better let us know and see if it works. <laughs> I just thought that was awesome. Okay, the next lady we're gonna talk about is Mary Gray Street Carter. This is Violet Gray Rubin's sister. So they're both from the Gray family. And she also had a cookbook. This cookbook is, is really funny. So this one is called the New American Cookbook. And in it, one of the chapters is invalid cookery. And it, it uh, she said, it was, it begins with a paragraph about the importance of avoiding a disordered stomach, which is caused by the non-assimilation of food. And then it goes through and explains what you should do, uh, apparently if you have a stomach ache. <laughs> so I loved it. Um, here's one of the recipes from the Invalid Cookery. See how you would like this one. It's called Toast and Water. Toast slowly a thin piece of bread until extremely brown and hard, but not the least black. Then plunge it into a jug full of cold water and cover it over an hour before using. It should be of a fine brown color before drinking it. And that was also one of the remedies for making coffee was um, to blacken bread and soak it so it blackened things. So I'm kind of glad we don't have that now if you have a tummy ache. <laughs> if you want to try it and it works, let me know. <laughs> okay, 
and I keep the slide here, I don't have any more pictures for you, but I have a couple of great stories. And they come from Laura Ingalls Wilder. Many of you are familiar with her stories, excuse me, <coughs> and her biographies. And much of what she wrote gave us a huge glimpse into how life was for the pioneers as they came into the valley. So this was great. I'm gonna read you this story about meat. Remember, they had to learn everything. Okay, here we go. One day, Uncle Henry came riding out of the big woods. He'd come to help Bob, Pa Butcher. It was such a busy day with so much to see and do. Uncle Henry and Pa were jolly, and there would be spare ribs for dinner, and Pa had promised Laura and Mary the bladder and the pig's tail. As soon as the hog was dead, Pa and Uncle Henry lifted it up and down in the boiling water till it was well scalded. Then they laid it on a board and scraped it with their knives, and all the bristles came off. After that, they hung the hog in a tree, took out the insides, and left it hanging to cool. When it was cool, they took it down and cut it up. There were hams and shoulders, side meat and spare ribs and belly. There was the heart and the liver and the tongue and the head to be made into head cheese and the dish pan full of bits to be made into sausage. The meat was laid out on the board in the back door shed and every piece was sprinkled with salt. The hams and the shoulders were put to pickle and brine for they would be smoked like the venison in, the, in a hollow log. You can't beat hickory cured ham, Pa said. He was, blow, he was blowing up the bladder. He made a little white balloon and he tied the end tight with a string and gave it to Mary and Laura to play with. So toys, animal toys. They could throw it in the air and spat it back and forth with their hands or it would bounce along the ground and they could kick it. But even better, full than a balloon was the pig's tail. Okay, here we go. Pa skinned it for them carefully, and into the large end, he thrust a sharpened stick. Imagine the tail, he stuck a stick in the tail, so the tail's kind of sticking out of the stick. Ma opened the front of the cook stove and raked hot coals out into the iron hearth. Then Laura and Mary took turns holding the pig's tails, tail over the coals. It sizzled and fried, and drops of fat dripped off it and blazed in the coals. Ma sprinkled it with salt. Their hands and their faces got very hot, and Laura burned her finger, but she was so excited she did not care. Roasting the pig's tail was such fun that it was hard to play fair taking turns. At last it was done. It was nicely browned all over and how good it smelled. They carried it into the yard to cool it and even before it was cool enough, they began tasting it and burning their tongues. They ate every little bit of meat off the bones and that was the end of the pig's tail. There would not be another one till next year. Uncle Henry went home after dinner and Pa went away to his work in the big woods. But for Laura and Mary and Mom, butchering time had only begun. There was a great deal for Ma to do, and Laura and Mary helped her. All that day and the next, Ma was trying out the lard, was trying out the lard in big iron pots on the cook stove. Laura and Mary carried wood and watched the fire. It must be hot, but not too hot or the lard would burn. The big pots simmered and boiled, but they must not smoke. From time to time, Mom skimmed out the brown cracklings. She put them in a cloth and squeezed out every bit of the lard, and then she put the cracklings away. She would use them to flavor Johnny Cake later. Cracklings were very good to eat, but Laura and Mary could have only a taste. They were too rich for little girls, Ma said. Ma scraped and cleaned the head carefully, the pig's head, and then she boiled it till all the meat fell off the bones. She chopped the meat fine with her chopping knife in the wooden bowl. She seasoned it with pepper and salt and spices. Then she mixed the pot liquor with it and set it away in a pan to cool. When it was cool, it would be cut in slices, and that was head cheese. The little pieces of meat, lean and fat, that had been cut off, the large pieces, Ma chopped and chopped until it was all chopped fine. She seasoned it with salt and pepper and with dried sage leaves from the garden. Then with her hand, she tossed and turned it until it was well mixed and she molded it into balls. She put the balls in a pan out in the shed where they would freeze and be good to eat all winter. That was the sausage. When butchering time was over, there were the sausages and the head cheese, the big jars of lard and the keg of white salt pork out in the shed, and in the attic hung the smoked ham and shoulders. The little house was fairly bursting with good food stored away for the long winter. The pantry and the shed and the cellar were full, and so was the attic. The attic was a lovely place to play. The large round colored pumpkins made beautiful chairs and tables. The red peppers and the onions dangled overhead. The hams and the venison hung in their wrap paper wrappings and all the benches of dried herbs, the spicy herbs for cooking and the bitter herbs for medicine gave the place a dusty, spicy smell. Aren't you glad? 
<laughs> that you don't live in the 1800s and have to do all that with each meal. Wow. Okay, so I was curious about why butter is colored. I've asked a couple of ladies and we're just not quite sure. And so from Laura Ingalls Wild, or Wilder, we learn a little bit about why it's colored. Okay, ready? In winter, the cream was not yellow as it was in summer. So for some reason, the cream was yellow in the summer, but not in the winter. And butter churned from it was white and not so pretty. This is cute. Ma liked everything on her table to be pretty. So in the winter time, she colored the butter. Listen to how she had to do it. Okay, turn the page. After she had put the cream in the tall crockery churn and set it near the stove to warm, she washed and scraped a long orange colored carrot. Then she grated it on the bottom of an old leaky tin pan that Pa had punched full of nail holes for her. So imagine you, you're poking, he poked the nail holes and then it kind of leaves that sharp edge. And so she just grates these carrots over and over and over again until it makes kind of this mush. She grated at the bottom, let's see. Ma rubbed the carrot across the roughness until it had rubbed it all through the holes. And when she lifted up the pan, there was a soft, juicy mound of grated carrot. She put this in a little pan of milk on the stove, and when the milk was hot, she poured let's see. When the milk was hot, she poured milk and carrot into a cloth bag. Then she squeezed the bright yellow milk into the churn where it colored all the cream. Now the butter would be yellow. Isn't that amazing? Just for looks. Who knew, right? They would make their own cheese. You would have harvest food. If you had people who came to work for you or threshers, you would need to make, you know, a lot of food. So Laurie Ingalls Wilder talks about Thanksgiving dinners. And then there are a lot of these recipes. So I'm going to name off some of these recipes. And if any of you want me to send you some, I can make some copies. We have St. Jacob's Soup. This was done by members of the Mormon Battalion. There's fish chowder, early lamb stew. We have Mormon gravy. This was cute. It said Mormon, Mormon gravy was common among the early settlers, made with ground beef or frizzled ham or bacon and served over baked potatoes. The pioneers often spooned it generously over meat pies made from small pieces of leftover meat or poultry cooked together with such vegetables as carrots, potatoes, turnips, onions, and seasoned with salt and pepper. So there's that recipe. The 101 year old pastry recipe. This was made by a, a lady who was, they got the recipe when she was 98 years old and it came from her family. So an old pastry recipe. We have the sourdough batter recipe and then the sourdough bread recipe that we, you would use from the batter. You have bachelor's pudding, parsnip fritters. Oh, I like this one too. East India curry and rice. This came from the McCune family. They came to Utah from India in 1857 where Matthew McCune, the father, had been serving in the British Army. And they brought this recipe as a reminder of their former home. And spices such as curry powder were pretty easy to get. So they were able to make this for their friends and family when they settled in Nephi, Utah. We have beef cabbage rolls, Mormon Johnny cake, whole wheat quick bread, potato cakes, pepper cookies, Swiss apple cherry pie. So that's all of the recipes. And then they also talked about the dyes that they used for clothing and things, how you got the reds and blues and purples. Um, so let me just see how much you guys know. What would you use to get a red dye for cloth? Think about it, think about it. All right, there's the matter plant. Apparently it has a red root. Hang the root of the matter plant to dry, then grind it into a powder add some water and you'll make a fast red. So a matter root. Okay, yellow. Think, think. What's gonna make something turn yellow? This was rabbit brush flowers. You boil it in water and the shade of yellow is determined by the amount of water you use. We have blue. I didn't like this one very much. Blue, anybody got blue? Okay, you ready for this one? Accumulate chamber lye or in parentheses it says urine, <laughs> in a covered barrel kept outside. When half full, add a woolen bag filled with indigo and stir with a long stick. So I'm assuming they needed the urine for the acidity of the indigo to stay. 
Place the wool in the barrel and hold it up with a stick every morning to let it get fresh air. When the wool is dark blue, put into tubs of fresh water to clean and then wash with soap and water. So indigo is the color. I think most of you probably knew that one, but oof, in the barrel of urine outside, it's a new one for me. Purple, simply combine the red and blue. Green, combine the yellow and blue. I know these are tough, right? Brown green, use peach leaves. Brown, use walnuts and onion skins. Black was made from squaw bush twigs. And gray, combine white and black wool. And you can change the various shades by how much you add of each color. So that is our lesson for today. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to try any of those recipes, just let me know and I'll make a copy and send them out. I hope you guys had an awesome Christmas and a happy new year. And we will, we will hopefully see you in the next couple of months.